Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program, and we come together on Wednesdays in order to do meditation together as a group. This is an opportunity to support, encourage, and motivate each other in our meditation practice. At this point in the group learning program, what I'm doing is I'm alternating between breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. And what I do is I just start the class with an actual meditation session for upwards of 20 or 30 minutes. And then after the meditation, I'll open up to any and all questions that you guys have. This is a great opportunity for free form questions about anything that you're challenged with related to the path to enlightenment. You'll be able to submit those questions through the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. And in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. So I'd like to welcome all of you, and at the same time, invite you to join for a meditation. I'm going to be guiding you guys, and if you'd like to take a seated position, standing or lying, these tend to be helpful for online learning. The seated position, you might be on the floor or you might be in a chair. And you'd like your lower body and your hands and arms to be nice and comfortable. If you're on the floor, you might have a cushion under your rear. This lessens the angles at your hips, knees, and ankles. And just lightly cross your legs. You're not interested in them being real tight because this would inhibit the circulation. Your hands and arms, you can put those in your lap. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together, and he put that into his lap. But there's other options here too. It's not about everybody doing it exactly the same way because this is impossible. So you could put your palms on your thighs, your palms on your knees, maybe your palms up. This all is helpful and works. Essentially, the lower body and hands and arms should be completely relaxed and comfortable, not luxurious and not painful, but comfortable. The upper body should be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. If your upper body was slouched, your mind would have a tendency to be complacent and not able to actively meditate to train the mind. But also, if your body was real rigid and uptight, your mind would be overactive. So you'd like the body to be in the middle, where it's erect, so that it keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. Next, you would like to just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here, you're just establishing the breath. I'm going to guide us through starting meditation by leading with some chanting. If you know these chants, you're welcome to join along. They're not anything mystical or magical. They're not a prayer or worship. It's just to help us ease into meditation. And if you'd like to chant along, you're welcome to. Afterwards, I'll come back with some guidance to help you get further into meditation. Arahang Samma Samuto Mahakawa Otang Mahakawanang Apiwa Tami Sawaka to Mahakawata Tamu Namang Namasami Supati Pano Mahakawato Sawaka Sanko Sanghang Namami Napmoera Sabhakavato Arato Summa 
พุทธสานับมวยรัสภาคว่าตัวอารหัตุสมมาสมพุทธาสานับมวยรัสภาคว่าตัวอารหัตุสมมาสมพุทธาสอิติปิสุมหาเกวาอารหังสมมาสัมโตวิชาจารณังสัมโนสกัตตุรกาวิตุอนุเตโรปุริสัดามาสติสัตตาวามนุสนังปุตุภะคะวะตีYou like to just be breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just establishing the breath, a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath, not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And whenever you get to it, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full exhale. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. In out. Your breath isn't going to necessarily match up with the guidance that I provide. I'm just here for guidance. This is your practice. I'm here to remind you to breathe in through the nose, whenever you get to it. And whenever you're ready, just exhale out through the nose, establishing a nice, steady. Gradual, consistent breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Once the breath is established, start fixating the mind on the breath, either the sound of the breath or the sensation of air coming into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off. Let it go. And come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or try to figure out where it's coming from. Just wherever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, 
cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in. In, out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you focus on the breath. Doing this work to train the mind to cut off and let go of any arising thoughts. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
to gradually make your way out of meditation we'll go ahead and transition our class over to opening up to any questions that you guys might have if you would like to ask questions related to the path to enlightenment you can put those into facebook youtube or zoom or if you're in zoom you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly i would like to just remind you guys as you're thinking about any questions that you might like to submit is that the breathing mindfulness meditation isn't to eliminate thoughts. What you're doing is you're arising mindfulness or awareness of mind, you're arising concentration, and you're training the mind to easily let go. So in meditation, when you're focused on the breath, that's helping you to focus on a fixed object and develop concentration. When you notice that there's a thought that has occurred, that's helping you to develop awareness of the mind. And you might even experience some bodily sensations during meditation that you're becoming aware of those four foundations of mindfulness, namely the bodily sensations. And then when the mind moves off the breath and you notice that, you're able to cut that off and let it go more and more easily and bring the mind back to the breath. This is helping you in daily life so that when you're in daily life, you have that concentration, the ability to focus on a single object and bring forth your full wisdom of things like right intention, right speech, right action, and others. And you have that awareness of your mind as you're going throughout your day-to-day -day activities. You can have awareness of what are the unwholesome thoughts and what are the wholesome thoughts. Because then you're going to need to take action to then cut off the unwholesome thoughts and eliminate them from the mind. And then support, encourage, and motivate the wholesome thoughts. So if you have mindfulness to be aware of what the unwholesome thoughts are and the wholesome thoughts, now when you see unwholesome things like anger and frustration or irritation arising any of those disconsent feelings if you see that the mind is interested in perhaps doing something like killing stealing having sexual misconduct lying taking substances that cause heedlessness and other things that are unwholesome you can cut that off and let it go if you see 
arrogance or conceit or pride arising in the mind, you're judging and measuring and comparing yourself or other people, you can cut that off and let it go. If you see negative self-talk arising in the mind, you can cut that off and let it go. If you see a lack of confidence in the mind, you can cut that off and let it go. But of course, your ability to cut that off and let it go becomes more and more developed as you consistently develop your meditation practice to accumulate the benefits of your meditation practice. If you're just meditating once a week or once every now and again, or you know, even just you know once a day, you're gonna notice that your progress is gonna be very slow. But if you can build up to two or three meditation sessions for 30 minutes or more and gradually build up to that, you will accumulate the benefits of being able to have that mindfulness, that concentration, and that ability to easily let go. Because as you're training your mind, you know, 20 times per meditation session, 100 times per meditation session, you're letting go, letting go, letting go. So now when you see these bodily sensations associated with anger and frustration and others starting to arise in your daily life, you can cut that off and let it go. And you save the mind of having to experience the anger or the frustration or the guilt or shame or fear or other discontent feelings that are coming into the mind. More and more, when you restrain the mind in this way, you're eliminating the cravings, desires, attachments, there will be no anger that arises. There will be no frustration or irritation or annoyance. There will be no guilt or shame or fear, the jealousy, the shyness, the resentfulness, all of these and others will be eliminated from the mind. But you'll need to have dedication and diligence to gradually train the mind and working in the direction of enlightenment. So there's the meditation that you're doing on a consistent ongoing basis, but there's other aspects too. So you'll like to look at the entire Eightfold Path of right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And you're going to need to revisit those teachings regularly. That's why you have the book. That's why you have the videos, the podcast, these classes, because you'd like to dial that in closer and closer. So if you're working on something like right speech, for example, maybe in the morning before you head out, or maybe on your phone while you're getting ready to start work, you look at the five factors of well-spoken speech and just remind yourself of that. Or if you're getting ready to go into an important meeting or an important conversation, you might remind yourself yourself of the five factors of well-spoken speech or as you're getting ready to go home and spend time with your family in the evening you might remind yourself of those five factors of well-spoken speech and you might do that periodically throughout your day over you know a week or two or three or four until you see that you're able to easily dial in the five factors of well-spoken speech more and more readily. And when it's been a month or two or three and you've dialed in the five factors of well-spoken speech really well and you're noticing in the vast majority of your conversations, you're practicing right speech, now you might try to dial in something else and you might look at that and then refresh your mind about that in the morning and periodically throughout your day or the evening. And this is how you just use some of the learning aids that I provide like the poster or you can do screenshots of slides or the screenshots of the books and you can store them on your phone or things like this or have posters around your house or have your children make posters and put them around the house like a little craft project. This can be a way to kind of bring the teachings into the mind and keep them ever present in the forefront of your mind. You don't need to be obsessive about it, but just gradually kind of reminding yourself of these teachings every now and again. This can be really helpful for you to ensure the teachings are front and center in your mind. So I'm going to open up to all the questions that you would like to ask. I see that there are some questions here in Zoom. There might be some on YouTube or Facebook as well. Why don't we start with Christine since she's got her hand up. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute, Christine, you can ask whatever question you like. Yes, thank you again for this session. Uh, I have one practical question for meditation and I have another one out of curiosity for cravings. Um, so the first one would be that I, every time I enter a kind of peaceful state in meditation, um, there comes some kind of, oh yeah, that's nice. And at the same time, there comes a feeling of, oh my God, now I'm going to have to sit with nothing for the next half an hour. Uh, and that's almost like a mix of fear and boredom. And then I kind of lose it again. Okay. So what's happening there is when you feel that nice 
peacefulness and joy coming into the mind, then the mind's craving it. And now it's going to go away. It's going to disappear. And then that's where the boredom is going to come in. So when you observe the peacefulness or the joy coming in, you know that it's there. You observe that it's there, but you don't allow the mind to get pleasant feelings because it's there. You're just like, hmm, okay, I see you peacefulness. Okay. And you just keep focusing on the breath. Don't allow the mind to indulge in any kind of pleasant thoughts because of it. And then you won't experience the diminishing of that feeling because it's a conditioned feeling at this point because you're getting those pleasant feelings when you notice the peacefulness. And then that's why the boredom comes in on the other side of that. So as the peace and joy is coming in, either in meditation or even in daily life, you can just be out and about in your life and you can notice some peacefulness. Don't be like, oh my goodness, there's that peacefulness. That's what Teacher Dave is talking about. Oh, I must be close to enlightenment. Oh, it's gone now (laughs) because the craving came in. So you just got to, hmm, okay, neat. The Buddhist teachings lead exactly where he said they do. Interesting. You know, you just kind of know that it's there. And because you're not craving it, then it'll persist for longer and longer periods of time. But you're going to get the lots and lots and lots of glimpses of what enlightenment is potentially like for you before you ever attain it. So this kind of thing, it's not like it goes from what you're experiencing now to, okay, you're enlightened. You're going to be getting these glimpses of momentary glimpses like this. You're going to be getting hours. You're going to be getting days. Sometimes you're going to be getting weeks, sometimes even months. You can go like three months or six months. Like the mind is so peaceful and joyful. And then boom, you're going to get some discontentedness, but it's going to be very insignificant and you'll be able to get rid of it right away. So that's why you got to get used to when the peacefulness and joy is coming in to just be like, hmm, interesting. Okay. All right. I see you. Peace and joy. So that'll help you to allow it to persist. Wow, thank you. I didn't realize that the boredom is following the excitement. Mm. I thought they're kind of at the same time. Mm. Uh, But I guess I have to examine this more closely and observe it more, what's happening there. Yeah, Um, because because of the pleasant feeling that is coming in when you see the peacefulness, there's craving that arises. And then because of that craving, the peacefulness is going to go away. And then that's where the boredom is going to come in right away. So by not allowing the craving to arise and cutting that off and just, hmm, interesting, peacefulness, joy. Okay. And that way you won't experience the arising of a craving, which is then going to ultimately lead to boredom. How does, sorry to ask this again, but how does the craving lead to boredom? I don't get this connection. Yeah, so when the mind is craving pleasant feelings, and if it gets what it wants, it's going to get those pleasant feelings, right? And then because Mm -hmm. it's basing its inner feelings on some condition, like the peacefulness, when the peacefulness is gone, then the mind's not getting what it wants, so it's going to move to another feeling like boredom or loneliness. So you will experience significant amount of boredom and loneliness in your meditation for a consistent long-term period until you train the mind to eliminate any craving related to wanting to do this or wanting to do that because the mind wants to be stimulated it wants it's that's what the craving is it wants to be stimulated so if you can train the mind to be peaceful and joyful with nothing other than focus on the breath and you can get to peacefulness with that in your meditation and you've eliminated the boredom in daily life when you're spending time with friends or you're watching tv or you're you know doing whatever wow life is so enjoyable because you've gotten to the point where you've stripped away all these layers that you can be peaceful and joyful with just the breath that's all you need and if you can get to that point then everything else in life is just a bonus so you're going to need to put the mind in that situation where it's in meditation for you know long-term periods of you know months and years where you might experience boredom for a period of weeks or months before you've eliminated the craving and clinging to any kind of 
a peacefulness or anything else that's happening in your meditation or anything that the mind wants to be doing outside of meditation. Because when the mind is in meditation, it's oftentimes craving to be on social media or watching TV or calling a friend or watching YouTube videos or something like this. So when you're in meditation, the mind oftentimes doesn't want to be there. It's craving something else externally. So that's where the boredom is coming in. Mm, I see. Yeah, I, I've eliminated the craving to do something else, more or less, but I think it's more a craving to think again. Perhaps you can investigate that and look inward and try to figure out what is the mind wanting in this situation. And of course, in the meditation itself, cut it off, cut it off, cut it off, cut it off. You're not doing any thinking in meditation to try to figure out what the craving is. You're just cutting off and cutting off and cutting off and coming back to the breath. But when you're outside of meditation, now you can reflect and you can be like, hmm, what was the mind wanting when I was in meditation? I felt so much boredom. There's got to be a craving somewhere or multiple cravings. What was it that it was wanting? And you can start looking inward and reflecting when you're outside of meditation. This is actually a really good point. Uh, can it be that we have a craving to reflect on our thinking? Because that's what I experience a lot in meditation. And these kinds of thoughts are so difficult to cut off. Like yeah. My mind just wants to figure out what cravings I have or, uh, or it's kind of on this meta level and it constantly wants to comment on it. And these ones are really hard to get rid of. Yes, the mind, the unenlightened mind is a master of craving. It will crave anything and everything. You you name it and it will crave it. By the time you get to enlightenment and you've stripped away all your cravings, you're going to be dumbfounded by how many cravings you really had to strip away. I think about it as like standing on the top of a garbage heap and this huge garbage heap. And every time you clear off the garbage, you drop down another layer like, oh my goodness, there's more garbage. And you keep clearing it off and clearing it off and clearing it off and clearing it off. And finally, at some point, you're going to get to stable ground on the bottom. But there's just this huge garbage heap that you're working through to get to some kind of stable ground. And there's just a litany of cravings that the mind can hold on to. Thank you very much. This was really interesting to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question, can I still ask it or should I first give time for others to ask their questions? Go for it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, the second question is, it's, I'm, I'm still not so, not so great in identifying my own cravings. Um, so that's, I really appreciate your input on that so that I, I can learn to make this connection faster. So yesterday there was a situation where I was actually for the very first time in probably 20 years playing board games again with my parents. Um, and I always thought of myself as a very good loser and that I really don't care about winning or um, really don't care about games at all so much. Um, but then I, I just had bad luck after bad luck after bad luck after bad luck. Uh, and I ended up losing. <laughs> and. I could observe the mind, like, not even the mind, it was not, there were thoughts like that, but there was this feeling of helplessness. And like, I'm always getting the shorter end of the broom. Um, and it felt in the body, it felt really bad. And I didn't know what craving it is. And I also couldn't let it go. It persisted until the end of the game. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. reflecting on this and I realized that Sometimes in life, I also have this feeling and I don't know exactly what's the craving behind that to let it go. It sounds like you had a craving to win. And it's important to understand that even in a board game, it's not luck. It's cause and effect. It's gamma. It's, it's the results of our decisions, action and results. So when we roll a dice, we're holding the dice in a certain way and there's a certain amount of force that we're putting on the dice and it's rolling and we're experiencing the results of our decisions. It's cause and effect or action and results. So while we tend to talk about it as good luck or bad luck, it's actually not good luck or bad luck. It's actually cause and effect. There's a cause. We picked up the dice, so we're holding them in our hand. 
Now we shake them, which is mixing them up. That's a cause, and the effect is they're getting mixed up. The cause is that we're re, you know putting a certain amount of force and releasing it, and now the effect is they roll out in front of us. So this is a cause and effect or action result, the results of our decisions. And when you're playing games, there can be a craving to win. This is the ego. This is the arrogance. This is the pride. This is that fetter of conceit that the Buddha identified as the eighth fetter that needs to be eliminated. So if you're noticing that your mind is irritated or annoyed or feeling you know uncomfortable with playing games and losing then what the mind will have a tendency to do is it'll want to push that away because of aversion like i'm not playing with you anymore right that's what the mind tends to want to do and it thinks that's going to solve the problem but that doesn't solve the problem because the craving is still in there the conceit is still in there so what you would like to do is put the mind in that situation repeated and continuing to play board games or continue to play video games or other games that the mind is uncomfortable with losing. And when you lose, train your mind to cut off and let go of any discontentedness that is arising. And that's what's cutting down and knocking out and eliminating more and more of that conceit. And as you eliminate more and more of that conceit, you'll get to a point where you can play these games and you won't notice any discontentedness arising because you realize that winning is not permanent. You can't permanently win. It's impossible. So you're going to experience losing sometimes, but losing is impermanent too. So if we allow the mind to crave permanence and permanently winning, then it's going to experience discontentedness. If we allow the conceit to arise, the arrogance, the pride. So what you would like to do is play the board game, not with the goal to win, right? That's usually how we start a game. We have a craving to win and we want to win. What you should do with games is your goal is to have fun and enjoy the company of the people around you. What makes board games so fun is the conversations and the jokes and the fun and the learning. Like some board games, you can learn trivia and you can gain wisdom. That's the real fun. The winning part is almost just like, you know, okay, like, so there's going to be somebody who wins perhaps. And sometimes uh, what you would like to do is not even pay attention to whether you're winning or you're losing, right? Just play these games in order to have conversation and build closeness and enjoyment with the people that you're with. Look at the laughter, sharing the food, you know, helping each other. Like if somebody rolls a dice and you hand it to them or or you help them move their piece around the board, you're practicing generosity. So you can be practicing right intention, right speech and right action. Even when you're playing board games, even practicing generosity to help people with the dice or moving their pieces around or giving them cards. And you just have fun with it and be jovial with it. And that's part of being enlightened is that you can enjoy a certain situation. And then when it's over, it's over and you move on to the next thing. But if you enter into a gaming environment where you have a craving to win, you're only going to be happy if you win because it's going to be a conditioned feeling. My happiness is based on the condition that I win. So what you would like to do is not do that because then when you lose, you're going to have a painful feeling of sadness or anger when you lose because you have conditional feelings. So what you would like to do is have the goal, objective, or interest that I'm playing this game in order to have fun with my family or my friends. And that's my only goal is just to sit here and have conversation and enjoy and maybe learn a new game and, and learn something new about the people that I'm spending time with. That's the real goal of these games. I muted you, by the way, Christine, because there was some sound coming in. Thank you very much for explaining this. It's, it's really interesting to see because I thought that I had the intention to just spend good time with each other. Mm -hmm. But obviously, the moment it started to go in this direction, um, there was something else. So I, I guess you're right. And it's, it's nice to frame it in this way to, to do it again and to work on eliminating the conceit and um, even more focus on practicing um, generosity and just enjoying it. Yeah, Thank the, you. Yeah, you're welcome, Christine. This is what happens when the mind is not yet in the jhanas. In the jhanas, there's oneness of mind. 
or unification of the mind. With oneness of mind or unification of the mind or oneness of mind, there's just one mind and you can observe the entire mind and you can see everything that's going on in the mind. But when you're not in the jhanas yet, there's a conscious mind and there's a subconscious mind. Both of these are polluted. The subconscious mind tends to be more polluted than the conscious mind. So consciously, you could be intellectually thinking that, hey, I would like to sit down and have fun and enjoy games with my mom and my dad. But the subconscious mind being more heavily polluted typically, it can be in there doing things that you don't even realize that it's doing, where it's like, man, I want to win this. Come on, let's go. Let's make it happen. And intellectually, you're just like, ah, oh, let's sit down and have fun. But this subconscious mind is like this dirty devil sitting on your shoulder, untrained and undisciplined and wanting to get its way all the time, having central desires and ill will and conceit and all these other things. And sometimes you're like, whoa, look at that. Like, where did that come from? I didn't even know that was in there. So as you train your mind by practicing the Eightfold Path and dialing that in closer and closer, you'll eventually get into the jhanas. And when you get to that second jhana, there'll be oneness of mind or unification of the mind where you can see the entire mind. But up until then, you can have experiences like this where intellectually you're going into something thinking you have all the best intentions in the world, but the mind is like this third entity. It's like this untamed animal doing something you didn't even know that it was doing. So be observant of that, that the subconscious mind is in there motivating all this unwholesome decisions that you didn't even necessarily intellectually know that it was doing. All right. Wow, thank you. This is really interesting. Uh, I never thought about this like that, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, sir. Yes, you're welcome, ma'am. Great question, great discussion. I'm sure it helped other people as well. I see Tony has his hand up, but I think Chrissy asked a question here in the chat. Let me see what she says. Teacher Davis, sir, would some of the unwholesome thoughts that we'd like to cut off be excitement and extreme pleasure? Yes, because those are conditioned feelings. We don't necessarily associate in the unenlightened state that our pleasant feelings are unwholesome or unwise because in the unenlightened state with craving desire attachment we think the whole this whole life is about chasing after our central pleasures so we just chase and chase and chase and chase thinking that that's what life's all about and when we get that excitement and that happiness we feel justified we feel vindicated in our chase and we feel that it was worthwhile but we don't see on the other side of that that we're getting these painful feelings because as long as you allow the mind to chase after pleasant feelings based on some condition it's only a matter of time before you get those painful feelings sometimes they can be more immediate or within a day or two other times like if you're chasing after a job for example like i know you already are well established in your job but just as an example or maybe you're chasing a life partner if you chase a life partner or a job you might get all these pleasant feelings and wow, it feels so great for a year or so or even six months or what have you. And as you are experiencing that, then when the relationship's over, you don't associate the painful feelings that you're experiencing because of the chase for the pleasant feelings. So as long as you allow the mind to get conditioned pleasant feelings, it will then get conditioned painful feelings because the condition that it's basing its pleasant feelings on is impermanent. So those pleasant feelings can't exist permanently. So as soon as you allow the mind to get conditioned pleasant feelings, you're setting yourself up for conditioned painful feelings at some point. So if you notice that the mind is basing its inner feelings on some condition, you would like to restrain the mind, cut that off, pull it back so that you don't experience those conditioned painful feelings. And as you do this more and more, the mind gets trained to not do this. But as you're transforming the mind over several years, you have to be observant of the mind with mindfulness and concentration and then develop the ability to easily let go so that when you see these cravings arise, you can restrain it and you don't allow it to get those conditioned pleasant feelings because that's the doorway to painful feelings. So that's why you would like to be observant of the mind. Where you observe the mind has unconditioned peacefulness or unconditioned joy, you don't have to cut that off because, and you can't cut that off. It's not possible to cut it off because it's not based on any condition. So if you wake up in the morning and you're just joyful just to be joyful, 
wonderful. You're just joyful just to be joyful. You, you're not waking up in the morning like, oh, I feel joy, like I need to cut this off. No, it's like you wake up in the morning, it's like, oh, wow, okay. Wow, there's some joy in the mind, excellent. Let's go forward in our day. So when you wake up like that and nothing's even happened and there's nothing that you even feel joyful about, you're not joyful about having woken up. You're not joyful because it's sunny outside. You're not joyful because you're going to go shopping today. These are all conditioned feelings. If your mind is happy because of something, that is a conditioned feeling. But if you're just joyful just for the sake of being joyful and there's no condition there, you can allow that to permeate in the mind and continue in the mind. You can't even cut that off. That's why by the time you get to enlightenment, the mind is unconditioned. There's no conditions in the mind that are producing the peacefulness and joy. And that's why you can't even cut it off. You can't even eliminate the peace and joy in the enlightened mind. But in the unenlightened mind, as soon as you see basing its inner feelings on some condition, which is like an event or a possession or a thing, as soon as you see the mind doing that, cut that off. Because if you allow the mind to get the pleasant feelings, which are unwholesome because they're unsatisfactory, and it's only a matter of time before they move to pleasant or painful feelings. So you would like to cut off and inhibit the mind from being able to form conditioned feelings. You're training the mind and disciplining it so well that eventually it will no longer create conditioned feelings. And that's how you ultimately get to enlightenment is through this process of observing that and then cutting it off and letting it go. Let's see. Chrissy says, the fear of cutting off conditioned joy is to never enjoy life again. I'm not sure I experience unconditioned joy. Yeah, so if you are holding on to the temporary happiness, you'll never be able to get to the permanent joy. So you've got to be willing to let go of this central desire and the conditional experiences in order to get to the unconditioned joy. So you'll go through a period of time where you will experience painful feelings and things like boredom and loneliness, like Christine was experiencing in meditation. You got to walk through the fire in order to get to the other side and appreciate the fresh air. So if you just keep holding on to this temporary happiness, you're going to always experience the sadness and anger and frustration and other feelings. But when you're willing to let go of this temporary happiness, eliminating the cravings, fully aware that because the mind had that temporary happiness based on conditions, you're now going to experience certain conditional sadness and anger and frustration and irritation. Some people have this underlying hum of agitation for a consistent long-term period of time as they're letting go of more and more cravings, there's like this persistent little hum of agitation that kind of persists in the mind for multiple days or weeks as you're transitioning your mind. So you've got to be willing to let go of this conditional happiness, realize that because the mind had that conditional happiness, you're going to have to also experience these conditional painful feelings for a period of time, but you're trying to get ahead of the curve and let go of more and more of these conditional pleasant feelings that are the mind is basing its inner feelings on these conditional experiences so that as you train the mind to no longer do that more and more and more you'll be getting less and less and less of the painful feelings but you're going to have to go through that in order to get to the other side you'll have to go through the fire to appreciate the fresh air on the other side all right you're welcome chrissy pleased to help you i see tony's got his hand up so what question do you have tony or questions yeah, three questions, everyone. Uh, thank you, Teacher David. Um, in the evenings, in the mornings, I wake up at three or four o'clock uh, uh, pretty well every morning, and, uh, and and then when I go back to bed, I, I meditate, uh, start meditating, and most of the time I'll be be conscious and be be aware of it, and I'll roll over and go to sleep. But sometimes I fall off, uh, drowse up. Uh, uh, Slumber, uh, slip off to end of sleep. Uh, is this something that uh, I should do, or should I? What would you suggest on that? You're dozing off to sleep as part of your meditation. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I'll roll over. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of not, you know, I'll finish and roll over, roll over and sleep. And then sometimes it just doze off. So, would would you say recommend this, or is this okay? Or yeah, what do you think about that. So. 
Sure. So as long as you're getting some dedicated meditation in and it's not like a persistent ongoing thing where you are always, you know, meditating and you're always, you know, dozing off to sleep, which is actually impossible because the universal truth of impermanence. Right. But as long as it's not like a consistent, persistent thing where you are at least getting dedicated meditation sessions that are dedicated solely to training your mind, then if this happens occasionally, that's fine. That's actually one of the benefits of having a a really well-developed meditation practice because when the mind's off the path to enlightenment and you're first getting started, boy, it can be really challenging to sleep, right? The mind can be overactive. There can be all kinds of cravings in there. You're trying to doze off the sleep and there's all this overactivity that's going on in the mind. And this is because of craving, desire, attachment. And there can be even anger, hatred, and a will that's coming to the mind as you're falling asleep. And all of this is happening because of the ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. So this is where the Buddha describes in his teachings that even as you're waking up in the morning and even as you're dozing off to sleep, you need to be observant of the mind. And if there's any unwholesome mental states that come into the mind, you even need to cut them off as you're falling asleep or as you're waking up. So... Uh, if it, this is happening occasionally, Tony, no problem. You know, that actually is one of the benefits is it'll help you to get better sleep and it'll train the mind to get better quality sleep. But, you know, this should be, you know, not the norm. It should be, you know, just something that might happen occasionally. And then more and more as your mind moves past all the pollutions, you'll get to the point where you'll have more defined, more dedicated training sessions. But even like last night, I was up until about 3.15 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, you know, because I help students at all hours of the day. And I knew I had to wake up at 6.30 the next day. So I knew I was only going to get three hours of sleep. So as I was laying in bed, after I had already done my dedicated meditation, I laid in bed and did some focus on the breath so that within five minutes I was able to fall asleep. So what I tend to do is I do my dedicated session and then I end that and then I then try to go to sleep and uh, sometimes I might use a little bit of focusing on the breath to help the mind ease into meditation. Uh, But this is not the norm for me at this point. But if you need that, then use it. That's one of the benefits of training the mind is that you'll get easier into sleep and you'll get better quality of sleep when you're there so but just be sure you have those dedicated sessions at different times that you're ensuring that you're not always using meditation and at the end of each one of your meditations you're falling asleep all right so let me look at our facebook and youtube platforms see if we have any questions there i'm not seeing anything in youtube and let's see facebook I'm not seeing anything in Facebook either. So it looks like that answers all the questions. Is there anyone else in Zoom that might have a question? I know, Christine, sometimes you hold on to your questions out of respect for others and you kind of come in at the end. So I don't see any more hands going up. But say thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Christine. Yep. All right. So. I will just end class with thanking all of you guys, whether you're joining live through any of the broadcasts or live streaming that we're doing, or they're listening to this on the replay, because I really admire people who are learning and practicing the teachings of the Buddha and have that dedication and diligence to actively build up their practice by learning the teachings. It's very admirable that somebody is taking the effort and energy to work on their own practice, because as you do, of course, it's going to help you. But it's also helping other people around you. And this is why I admire people who dedicate time and effort and energy and resources to practicing these teachings because you're doing the most loving and kind and compassionate thing you could ever do, which is work on your own mind. Because by you working on your own mind, sure, it's helping you, but it's helping the people close to you and it's helping all of humanity because you're producing less harm in the world for others to deal with. So lots of respect and appreciation and gratitude for all of you guys that are learning with me, whether it's live or in the replays or however it is that you're gaining this content. Much respect to all of you guys. And at the same time, I would like to invite you guys to our future classes. This Sunday in the group learning program, we're going to be in chapter 13, which is titled Identifying Cravings, Cultivating Non-Craving and Analysis of the Mind. This is where I'm going to teach you how to identify your own cravings 
and develop this ability to eliminate them above and beyond just meditation and generosity because you need those things on board and all the steps of the Eightfold Path need to be on board. But there's this other skill, this other technique that you're going to need in order to surgically remove your attachments. And this is going to be really helpful for you as you learn that, whether you learn it live or through the replay. And then next Wednesday, we're going to be doing loving kindness meditation. So you're always welcome to join for that. Same thing where we'll meditate together and then open up to any questions that you guys have. So we'll see you guys in one of these future classes. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Be well. Sawadika. Sawadika. Thank you very much, Teacher David. You're very welcome, ma'am. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.